Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, we are going to be covering acute inflammation, and it's a big topic, so I'm going to split it up into the next two videos. So this will be Acute Inflammation Part 1, and this is the second video in the chapter of Immunology and Inflammation. In the first video, we covered some introductory things like the difference between adaptive and innate immunity, as well as the difference between humoral and cell-mediated immunity. Now, if you'd like to go back and watch that first video, you can click the Stomp on Step 1 logo to see a table of contents for all the videos in this chapter. Inflammation is the process of inflammatory cells, plasma proteins, and fluid from the circulatory system traveling into the tissue in response to cell injury or infection. Inflammation has a set of distinct phases. Generally speaking, there is acute inflammation, which is analogous to innate immune system, and chronic inflammation, which is analogous to the adaptive immune system. Here's a flow chart outlining what happens during inflammation. You can see here in the top right corner, I give this topic of acute inflammation a high yield rating of five. For those of you that are not familiar with the high yield rating, it's a scoring system from zero to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE step one. And if you'd like to learn more about how the high yield rating is calculated or how to interpret it, you can click this orange box here. Now this diagram is a bit oversimplified, but it should have everything you need to know for the exam. Inflammation is initiated by cell injury or cell infection up here at the top. And then you will progress into acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is further broken down into three distinct phases. We will first look at the fluid phase, which starts immediately after the onset of injury or infection. In the fluid phase, there is arterial dilation, which brings more blood and fluid to the site of injury or infection. Additionally, there's an increase in venial permeability. This means that more of the fluid inside the vessels spills out into the affected tissue. This is what causes the characteristic swelling, redness, and warmth of acute inflammation. Additionally, you're going to have activation of the complement system and various cytokines are going to be released, but I'm going to cover the cytokines in more detail in the next video in the section. Here is a diagram covering what happens during the fluid phase. So first we'll look at a normal vessel. You've got the arterial small artery leading into the capillaries, which then exit into the venule, a small vein. Normally there is no net flow between the vessel and the tissue. The amount of fluid flowing out of the vessel into the tissue is approximately equal to the fluid flowing back into the vessels. However, during the fluid phase of acute inflammation, there is net flow of fluid into the tissue. So there's a lot more fluid flowing into the tissue than there is fluid flowing in the reverse of that direction. A majority of this net flow is going to be cytokine-directed vascular changes, but vessel injury also contributes. Obviously, if there's some sort of damage to the vessel, it's going to bust open and just kind of spill out all that blood in that vessel into the tissue. Cellular injury and infection cause the release of histamines, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and bradykinins. Additionally, the small number of sentinel macrophages that reside in the tissue recognize the need for inflammation and send out cytokines of their own. Collectively, these cytokines trigger the fluid phase by causing the dilation of the arterioles and the increase in the permeability of the venules. And this happens through pericyte contraction. So there are very small pores along the venule wall. And normally those pores are close to shut. But these little contractile cells called pericytes along the vessel wall can contract and make those pores much larger. So that what, that's what leads to the higher level of venial permeability because now it's not a solid wall, it's got a bunch of these little holes in it where fluid can come and go. 
And you can see here as well that the arterioles are going to dilate. So they're going to be much thicker than they were before, bringing more blood to the tissue. So that was just the fluid phase, which happens immediately after injury. Now we'll talk about the neutrophil phase, which peaks at about one day. And it is the second part of acute inflammation. It is a direct consequence of the fluid phase. The fluid phase causes hemodynamic changes that get neutrophils to travel into the affected tissue. Once they're there, the neutrophils can phagocytose pathogens and dead necrotic tissue. In this way, they're going to clear out all of the junk that's causing the problem so healing can start later. I'm going to cover the exact mechanism of neutrophil extravasion in the next video. After the neutrophil phase, we're going to have the macrophage phase. And this is going to peak at about two days after the injury. This is very similar to the neutrophil stage, except that the predominant phagocyte is the macrophages instead of neutrophils. But they're basically doing the same thing. They get to the tissue via the same extravasion mechanism, so it's not all that different. To review, early on, acute inflammation is primarily done by neutrophils. And then later on in acute inflammation, you've got more macrophages than neutrophils. Finally, the last pseudo step of acute inflammation is what I call macrophage management. Through the release of cytokines and direct interactions with other cells, macrophages decide what the next step is going to be. If the problem has already been resolved by acute inflammation, then healing and scar formation will be initiated. If acute inflammation was unsuccessful in removing the noxious stimuli, then macrophages can initiate chronic inflammation by acting as the antigen-presenting cell for the T-cells. In some unique circumstances, additional acute inflammation is needed. Again, cytokines released by the macrophages are going to cause you to go through acute inflammation again. And that may be counterintuitive because acute and chronic should be more differentiated by the time, but they're really not. The difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation is their mechanism. So you can have acute inflammation for months in some cases, and it's still acute. It doesn't become chronic just because of how long it's been going on. That brings us to the end of this video. It was a pretty quick review of acute inflammation, but it should give you enough detail to do well in the test. And then we'll dive a bit more into the details in the next video. If you like this video and would like me to make more, please do comment below to let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions or suggestions, and that would really help me out. And if you'd like to see the next video in this section, which is going to cover the different cytokines like histamine, bradykinin, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes, as well as the neutrophil extravasion, complement system, and a couple other things, you can please click on this black box here and it'll be taken directly to that video. Thank you for watching and good luck with the studying.